This is Jeff Herman from the Business Journal. Welcome to the new normal, please. This is a live virtual event brought to you by the Mahoning County Mental Health and Recovery Board and the Business Journal. My name is Jeff Herman. I'm the CEO of the Business Journal, and I am joined by a set of very esteemed panel members from the Mahoning County Mental Health and Recovery Board, and they include Larry Moliterno, President and CEO of Meridian Healthcare. Also joining us is Carolyn Givens, Executive Director of the Neil Kennedy Recovery Clinic. Also joining us is Joe Shiroki, the CEO of Alta Group, and Joseph Caruso, President and CEO of Compass Family and Community Services. So thank you all for joining us today. We certainly appreciate your time. You know, uh, May, as we all know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And, that, and that's, just, that's something critical that we need to address in, uh, in our daily lives, the importance of mental health. Uh, but now more than ever, it's especially more important now more than ever because we're um, you know, still amidst in this coronavirus crisis, right? The, the, the crisis st is still among us. And so our focus today is on adjusting to the new normal in the midst of this global pandemic, right? So as we all return to the workplace, the economy has, is being reopened after a long shutdown. Well, this means uh, both employers and employees must adjust to this, to this new normal. And so there are many issues stemming from uh, and still happening from this coronavirus crisis, from this global pandemic, emotional and behavioral issues, things that are happening in the workplace, uh, things that may not even, may go unseen simply because of the virtual environment we live in. So uh, before we get started on the panel discussion, I would like to go over some housekeeping. And once again, for those of us uh, just joining us, we appreciate you joining us both in here on the Zoom platform and also on Facebook Live on the live stream. This is a live event and we are streaming this and we will have uh, uh, each of our panel members has prepared some really important talking points and some very important insights to share. Uh, but I encourage you please to use the Q&A function on Zoom and the chat box on Zoom as well as uh, questions in the feed on Facebook Live. So we please start staging your questions now and we'll get to them um, as we progress. But it's important that we have a very unique opportunity here. We have members of the, of the, of the community that can directly answer questions affecting employers and employees here in the workplace. So uh, we will run, it's currently 11.33. We will run this for about an hour and leave a little bit of time, uh, additional time for Q&A and overflow. But uh, we once again want to thank everyone for joining us today. New Normal, please. Uh, this is a, a live event and a discussion with the Mahoning County Mental Health and Recovery Board. So the housekeeping is out of the way. The attendees are with us and we thank them for joining us. And to kick us off, I would like to introduce our first panelist, and that is Larry Moliterno, President and CEO of Meridian Healthcare. And Larry, please, I'll hand it over to you. Would you like to please make some opening comments? Uh, well, thank everybody for, for tuning in. I think it's really gonna be a great conversation today to talk about um, how our system is being affected by everything that's happening out there. Uh, but I wanna take a minute and just say briefly about Meridian Healthcare, who we are, what we do. Um, the thing for us is we provide a, a continuity of care. So we recognize that a lot of folks out there uh, who suffer from uh, mental health issues or addiction issues also have other types of, of things that they need in their lives to make them complete. So as an organization, we not only provide treatment for addiction, uh, whether it's uh, uh, a gambling addiction or whether it's alcohol addiction or drug addiction, we also provide uh, mental health counseling for short-term anxiety, depression, the stuff that we all deal with on a regular basis, especially now. Uh, we also provide primary health care for folks, which includes even chiropractic work to help people deal with chronic pain. Um, but we also provide community-based prevention programs. So not only in schools, but working with people who are um, children who are in our various programming and our housing programming. 
Uh, we provide permanent housing shelters for individuals. Uh, we have a whole division that works with the criminal justice system to make sure that, you know, a lot of the folks who, um, there's some crazy statistics that show that 75% of the people who are incarcerated have a mental health or a drug or addiction problem. Uh, and it makes a whole lot more sense uh, to provide treatment for people and get them back out in the community and back out working and back out with their families than to keep them locked up. So we do provide this sort of uh, continuity of care for the individuals that we serve. Uh, one of the other things that we do, which I think is appropriate for discussions today, is our employee assistance program. Uh, and this is a service that we provide for businesses who recognize that they want their employees to be productive and their, their, their employees are going to be more productive if they're happy, if they're not dealing with stress and anxiety. Um, and we actually saw statistics recently, which I found interesting. There was a study done, 49% of employees admit that they lose about an hour a day of productivity due to stress. And again, I'm sure that that number during these times is even higher than that. So, you know, for a lot of employers, um, they recognize that it's a pretty smart investment in their people um, to provide these, these types of services. So somebody who's having problems in, the, in, their, in their home life or they're having health problems or they're having some other things, they're now having a negative effect on their work performance and, and allow us to come in and work with those folks, again, to make them more productive for you. Um, one of the things that we've also adjusted to during you know, this whole COVID thing is uh, the use of telehealth. And we not only do telehealth for our primary health care, but also for our mental health and for our addiction services. And what we're finding is actually for a lot of folks that we serve, if transportation is a problem, that's solved through telemedicine. And also we're all, uh, we find with a lot of people with mental health issues, there's a lot of social anxieties that come with just going out into public. And so for us to be able to phone in the, in, or uh, you know, go through a Zoom access like we're doing here and going into people's homes and providing this care, it, it's much more effective. And so I think we're gonna find that things that we're using to adapt and to adjust to this COVID virus are things that we're gonna wanna use ongoing and they're gonna make us more efficient um, down the road, and they're going to become a permanent part of um, what we do. Um, the other thing I want to mention briefly is that we want to recognize that for people out there who are running organizations, how stressful this is for you, because you have that added responsibility of making sure that your employees are being taken care of. You know, you have to worry about your own family, but at the same time, you're worried about making sure that your employees are going to have a job and that your, and your, your organization is going to continue to function. And we also recognize that especially in these days, when most of us who run organizations, we like to plan, we're planners. And it's very difficult to plan over the next six months or two years or three years when there's so much uncertainty that evolves with all, with all of that's going on right now with this pandemic. So the last thing I'll mention before I hand it off is I think there's a couple of things that we need to do. I think we need to recognize that what's really causing a lot of stress for a lot of us during this period is uncertainty. Uh, it's the not knowing. And how do we deal with that? Um, and I think there's a couple of ways we can do it. Number one, I think with our employees and with our families, I think we have to validate the fact that we're all afraid right now. There's a level of fear that we all have. And even though as leaders of organizations, we have to try to hide that and be strong, we're feeling the same thing as other people. And so let's recognize that and, and let's let people talk about it. Um, I also think that we have to figure out how we identify what's productive stress and what's unproductive stress. You know, um, what can we control? What can't we control? Um, because there is stress that, that can be productive if it makes us more creative and it makes us think of new ways of doing things and it makes us think of solutions. Um, that kind of stress can actually be productive. But we have to rule out anything that we can't have any control over. Let's not stress over. Um, I also think that what we have to do is, is create other types of routines so that we can have some control over this uncertainty. You know, uh, we were talking earlier, you know, a lot of us like to grill outside and being able to come home at the end of, the, of, of a day of work and, and light the grill in the backyard or go for a walk or even just reading the newspaper outside. Those are the new rituals that we can kind of create so that internally we feel like we have some control over a situation is so uncontrollable and uncertain. 
Um, and I think a couple of other things, I think that um, let's make sure that we do a couple of things. Let's make sure that we take time to laugh, that we take time to make sure that we're, we're doing that for ourselves. And let's take time during this period to show some gratitude. Let's look at the things that we're happy for. Let's focus on our families that are safe and the things that we're doing and, and the folks that we work with. And let's take the time to, to, to literally just be happy and grateful and thankful for the things that we have in our life that are going well. Excellent. Excellent points, Larry. I mean, I especially want to echo uh, focus on gratitude and, and being grateful. And every morning we wake up, uh, it's great to appreciate and be grateful just for that act of, of waking up and putting your feet on the ground and being able to start another day. And I do want to bookmark the topic of productive stress uh, because there, there's a belief that, you know, if we've all watched The Last Dance, I'm sure, the Michael Jordan, um, he was a big purveyor of productive stress, if not <laughs> harassment of his teammates. <laughs> they won championships. Right. However, I've seen several articles out there that, you know, is he an employee? Is he a toxic employee? Would, you know, is he toxic on your team? We could debate that a lot. So that's, that's not something we want to debate right now, but uh, I do want to get back to that here during the Q&A session. So I, I, Larry, really want to thank you for joining us today. Thanks for your thank open you. comments. And we will now proceed to Carolyn Gibbons. Carolyn, the executive director of Neil Kennedy. Carolyn, could you please uh, take it away, introduce yourself and provide your opening comments. It's Carolyn and happy to be here and thankful for all of you who have joined us and certainly my colleagues today and the Business Journal, as well as the Mahoning County Recovery Board. So Neil Kennedy is the oldest nonprofit in the state of Ohio. We're uh, 75 years old, soon to be. We were created in 1946. And uh, we provide a full continuum of uh, treatment services uh, to our population of folks. We serve about 1,500 people a year. We have a detox unit at uh, Mercy Health on the sixth floor on Belmont Avenue. And we have residential services that range from a strong intensive inpatient service to uh, having our patients go to the recovery homes and be able to transition to a lower level of care and then eventually to our Austin Town outpatient site and uh, IOP. We have just recently through uh, the, the COVID virus though became very organized around telehealth um, and my hats off to our, our Neil Kennedy leadership for um, helping us to stay open and true to our mission throughout this uh, process of the pandemic. You know, Larry's talked uh, a little bit about an employee assistant training. I'd like to also talk about the fact that we offer drug-free workplace training for uh, businesses across our community who might need to uh, better understand what addiction, the chronic health illness of addiction, mental health uh, might be and what that might look like. It's extremely important during this period of time that we consider the fact that people are feeling isolated. And so the issues of addiction become exacerbated during periods where there's high anxiety, uh, the unknown, the fact that there has been job losses, interruption to family. All of these things can be triggers for a person that is experiencing either depression, other mental illnesses, and certainly addiction. So one of the things that we have looked at at Neil Kennedy uh, beyond making sure that we provide protocols for uh, our staff and our patients that are with us is to think about how we check in with each other every day. You know, being able to provide a sense of hopefulness during these difficult times is extremely important. And right now, one of the concentrations that we have, because there's been such isolation, is to figure out how we restart uh, and bring back visitors, um, some of our ancillary services, such as yoga, meditation, uh, expressive art experiences, things of that nature that enhance a person's productivity while they're in treatment. Treatment in and of itself is a new change, and it's about surrendering. And this pandemic has once again echoed to people that there might not be necessarily the strong controls over their life that they once had. And so we've had to change. And the new normal has required us to think outside of the box 
and talk about things like telehealth as a great opportunity, checking in with people by phone even, or FaceTime can help save a person from depression or additional addiction. We've moved a lot of our meetings uh, for um, NA and AA and CA on to a Zoom platform. And that in and of itself, I think, is uh, has become very popular with uh, many of our community members. When we're thinking about the impact of the COVID virus and some of the additional uh, urgency that's needed. It's, it's trying to help people not feel burdened. You know, one of the signs of additional depression or even suicide ideation, which we don't like to have to talk about, is that if a person feels burdened or that they're a burden to others, and if they feel isolated and hopeless, they're more likely to suffer depression, self-medicate with substances, and then consider taking their own life. It's important that each of us find a way to check into one another and with one another throughout this process. We remain hopeful at Neil Kennedy. We want to be able to serve the community as we have for 75 years. Our fellowship hall is uh, where we have our meetings. Currently it is closed because we're having, you know, the Zoom meetings are available. And we're in the process of talking to state officials, uh, my parent company, which is our parent company, which is Gateway Rehab Services in Pennsylvania, and also with Dwayne Picciarelli and others within the community to gauge when we should open back our, our meetings at Fellowship Hall. In between time, though, it's important that you, we remain hopeful and that you remain hopeful. We uh, can be reached at any time. We're 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. And there's opportunities at uh, in different elements without going into greater detail uh, because of the presentations that you're going to hear later on, that depression is not just a single situation. It can be caused uh, through a chronic illness and people feeling that they're in greater pain. The substance use disorder piece is a part of some of this. And for our older population, who might even feel in greater seclusion, reaching out to them has been critical. And we would encourage others to do that as well. Um, I'd be happy to answer additional questions um, as we get further into our Q&A. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. Really appreciate the opening comments. And, and especially would like, um, we have had questions leading up to this event. The benefits of yoga and, and alternative methods and maybe you know, think about, we'll get back to this during the Q&A, but uh, tell us a story of someone that perhaps resisted uh, doing yoga or other physical ways of expressing themselves and, and perhaps a positive outcome because of it. So that, that story of, of how you got someone from resistance to, to full utilization would be wonderful. Great, gladly. So thank you. And uh, next, I would like to introduce Joe Shiroki. Hello, Joe. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, good morning, Jeff. And uh, it's an honor to be here with you and my esteemed colleagues and friends uh, who are out there fighting the good fight uh, along with us. So uh, pleased to be here. Uh, briefly, I've talked for you know a minute or two just about Alta Care Group and who we are and what it is we do. And you know, I think of the the old they're closed now, unfortunately, but kids are us. Um, that's us. So we are the, you know, the, the child, adolescent, young adult provider for uh, Mahoning County. And uh, we also do some work in Trumbull County. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of kids out there. You know, as, if you're a parent and you have kids, you think about children that you know, the idea of them having to go to a behavioral health organization or see a counselor or a, a psychiatrist, you know, it's heartbreaking. Uh, you know, it's a difficult thing for us to think about, especially as we think about our own kids. But we have about 2,000, a little over 2,000 kids a year uh, that we're working with that come to Alta. And, um, you know, we provide a full continuum of outpatient behavioral health services with them, along with a number of different uh, specialty programs. So all the counseling and case management, psychiatric care, um, crisis intervention, but also, you know, you hear a lot about trauma now. And, you know, trauma 
uh, is very pervasive and, and it begins in childhood often. You know, we talk about adverse childhood experiences and how they can affect our health down the road as adults. And um, a lot of the kids we work with are coming in having experienced various levels of trauma. So we have a trauma uh, treatment unit. We also have, unfortunately, a lot of very young kids, uh, even younger than six, seven years old. So uh, we have an early child mental health unit that we work with a lot of those youngsters. And we do a lot in the way of school-based mental health. So we're in uh, counselors when schools are open, we're, we're all over the county, uh, working with various schools and districts and providing counseling on site to students and consultation to teachers as well. And then in addition to the behavioral health, Ulta Care Group has another division called Ulta Head Start. And we provide uh, the federal Head Start program for all of Mahoning County and the city of Youngstown. So we serve about another 820 kids in that program, aged birth to five, uh, in 11 different locations throughout the county. But what I, what I really wanna talk about today is, um, well, I wanna also mention similar to uh, Carolyn and Larry and Joe, and out of necessity, uh, we also are providing telehealth. So uh, that's been an interesting transition, far smoother for both us and our clientele than we anticipated. You wouldn't think that uh, you know, that would be a, a very engaging way, at least my generation doesn't necessarily think that, but uh, you know, kids are really into it. And especially the teenagers and the, the pre-adolescents um, and the families are very engaged through telehealth. And uh, because of that, we're able to continue providing all of the services that we normally provide. So we're still taking intakes and referrals, still providing treatment of uh, all sorts that we normally provide. As, a, as an employer, one of the key things that, you know, we try to keep our, our mind on and our, our eyes on is how do we keep our employees engaged when we're working in a remote environment like this? You know, it's easy for them to feel, especially in a, in a healthcare setting where they're all working from home, uh, working from remote locations, that they don't get to interact and they don't get to see each other very often. So how do we keep them engaged and feeling part of our team and feeling uh, motivated and, and inspired to do the work that they do? So one of the things that we recommend doing that we're doing every morning is we have a morning huddle. Uh, they're done by Zoom and they're, they're audio-visual meetings that we have with key personnel uh, to, to stay in contact, to talk about what challenges might be coming up that day, uh, and just to keep, you know, to see their faces and be able to communicate and, and share our common experience. Uh, the other thing we're, we're really doing a lot more of, and I, you know, I'm going to talk in a few minutes about embracing change, is uh, rather than having a phone call with a, an employee in a different location, maybe they're in a different office location that we normally would do by phone, we're now doing by, by Zoom um, or by a Teams meeting because it's just more present, we believe, and we feel that um, your entire person is there more with them and, and that helps toward engagement and a sense of camaraderie. We also are doing, in addition to those, those daily huddles, is we also do formal uh, team meetings or department staff meetings and we do those either weekly or monthly and you can see everybody there and everybody has an opportunity to see and interact with their peers and we just believe keeping employees engaged is one of the most critical things that we can do right now not only in terms of uh, keeping them emotionally healthy but keeping them productive and that's key for all of us. The other thing related to employee engagement I think is you know, it's difficult, but we, we do it and we recommend it as keeping in contact with those staff that might be furloughed or laid off. So we maintain and have maintained throughout this, any staff that we furloughed, a weekly contact. We're checking in with them, uh, you know, finding out how they're doing. Is there anything that we can do for them or with them, giving them the most current and up-to-date information that we have as an employer. Uh, so those are, those are important points in terms of engagement. I did mention embracing change, and I think that we have to look at this as an opportunity, and it's an unfortunate opportunity that we're going through this, but it really is a chance for us to look at how we do business and how can we do things a little bit differently that might make us more efficient even coming out of this. And this, we found many different things. You know, one is working remotely. Uh, you know, it remains to be seen how flexible and accommodating the telehealth and the HIPAA rules will be for healthcare providers moving forward. But we know that both uh, client 
engagement has improved, no-show rates have decreased, um, productivity still remains strong. And if we can provide some opportunity for our staff to continue uh, engaging in a workplace through remote settings like that, it would be a wonderful thing and we hope to be able to do that. The other is schedule flexibility. We know, especially in the younger group of employees these days, that flexibility is important. And uh, I think we're learning that for all of us, flexibility can be important. And if we can provide opportunities for staff to work in non-traditional hours when they're working remotely, uh, we found some significant value in doing that. And again, something that we wanna look forward uh, to possibly continuing in some aspects. Uh, different ways to keep engaging staff, uh, not just through uh, Zoom meetings and, and FaceTime and Doxy, things that I, some of them I had never heard of before. Doxy was new to me. But um, keeping them engaged at times where they might not be able to come to work, but would like to come to work. So we have staff who have been uh, mildly ill, not with COVID, fortunately, but with a strep infection or uh, some other contagious illness, pink eye, where they normally wouldn't have been able to come to work. But they've been able to continue work remotely from their home environment. And that's something that goes back toward flexibility again, that I think we want to find ways to continue. Not to mention a reduction in travel expenses, which is always good for an employer. Uh, Lastly, as a, as a kids provider, and when I say kids, we work with, as I said, birth up to uh, 21, in some cases a little bit beyond that. Uh, it's important for parents to know, you know, how do we talk to our kids during this difficult time? And how do we communicate with them about what's going on? And that could be very stressful for a parent. How far do I go? How much information do I give them? Sometimes kids are asking for information and we don't know what to tell them. The thing we say to parents is be intentional about communicating with your kids. Don't necessarily wait for them to come to you. Um, be open to the communication and feel free to engage them. Not giving them more detail than they're developmentally able to handle or that they need, but letting them know that you know, there is a, a bug going around that is harmful to people and this is why people are wearing masks and uh, we have it within our control to stay safe and to not worry about that if we do these certain things like hand washing and wearing masks. The other thing is invite them to ask questions. Again, being intentional and not being afraid of the topic, but hey, you see a lot of people wearing masks. You wonder what that's about, or um, this whole thing about not going to school and business is closed. Do you have any questions that I can answer you um, about that? Probably most importantly as a parent, talking to young children is uh, remaining calm and be reassuring so that you know, kids know when we're stressed, you know, regardless of what the situation is, and they often react to that. So the way we, we react and reassure our children is going to be critical for them. And keep the conversation going. It shouldn't be a, a one-time discussion, but to keep it going with, uh, with the kids. Right. No, that's great, Joe. I certainly appreciate those comments. And, and something that's um, often top of mind is how do you strike that balance between positivity and encouragement, but still showing your true feelings of stress and anxiety. And how much, how far do you go with your kids where you want to be realistic and, and you know, engage in a, in a transparent conversation, but at the same point, not freak them out. <laughs> and so that's something, that's a topic that's come up uh, quite a bit. And especially because kids aren't getting the socialization that they've, that they're used to with going to school every day. And the virtual experience has tra translated better for some than others. And in a time where we're encouraging our kids, put the phone down, get off the Xbox, <laughs> that's all they have to stay connected to their friends nowadays. And so that's, it's, but that's also been a challenge and something that we'll get into in the Q&A section or on how to address you know, th those issues around screen time and. I know I'm not playing the Xbox. I'm hanging out with my friends. And oh, by the way, we're playing 2K. You know, <laughs> it's just a topic of discussion quite frequently. <laughs> so, you know, we certainly uh, appreciate those, those comments, Joe. Thank you very much for sharing. And then uh, next, we uh, would like to welcome Joseph F. Caruso, President and CEO of Compass Family and Community Services. So, Joe, thanks so much. Uh, for joining us. We'd love to hear your perspective and your, your thoughts here on uh, dealing with the current situation at hand. 
Well, Jeff, uh, and to the Business Journal, I want to thank you very much for making this opportunity available, as well as to the Mahoning County Mental Health and Recovery Board, uh, the partners here as well, uh, my board of directors and my awesome group of employees, my colleagues that, uh, that work here at Compass. Uh, Compass uh, was founded back in 1908. Uh, we currently have 320 employees that service Mahoning and Trumbull County uh, primarily uh, in 14 different locations. Uh, we provide an array of services, including Sojourner House Domestic Violence Shelter, a Runaway Homeless and Abandoned Youth Shelter of Daybreak, the Rape Crisis and Counseling Center, uh, that services uh, Mahoning County, and then uh, our workforce development program. Our workforce development program works with individuals with work limiting disabilities, as well as individuals without disabilities, with our incredible uh, community businesses to put people to work and help them stay and rem remain working. Uh, but we're here talking today is about our behavioral health services and what's available here in our community and how we can deal with this new normal. Um, Compass has been providing both residential treatment for persons with mental health and addiction disorders, uh, as well as residential, as well as outpatient services. We also provide uh, prevention services in the schools uh, in, in Trumbull County. And then we do work in the, with the Mahoning County Mental Health Court, uh, as well as the Trumbull County Drug Court uh, in some other areas uh, in the criminal justice system, as well as providing services at the county jail and at Community Corrections Association here, the not-for-profit in Youngstown on Market Street. But, you know, Compass is very proud to be a part of this community and very proud to have partners. Uh, you know, we partner with uh, Neil Kennedy and uh, Meridian Healthcare for helping people get into detox. We don't do detox. We partner with those individuals who do it and do it very, very well. Uh, as well as we partner with Meridian Healthcare in our Warren office, providing medication assisted treatment and their primary healthcare. And it's uh, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, with Joe at Daybreak, the first program uh, for first episodes with schizophrenia, with Alta, as well as the services that they provide to our youth that are in our Daybreak facility. But one thing that I, you know, that's, that's Compass. But, you know, I've been president and CEO and fortunate for uh, 15 years now. This is my 15th year with Compass. And I'm an employer and we employ 320 individuals. And when this pandemic kicked off, my first concern came to be worrying about my staff, worrying about the 320 people who rely on our ability to provide services to help them meet the needs of our community at large. And our mission is to help individuals and families build better lives in a stronger community. And with this pandemic, it was a real fear of mine. And I will tell you, I was very stressed as president and CEO of this organization. I, I was very fearful. I was, you know, emotionally stressed about what may happen to the staff and subsequently what may happen to the community. You know, we had to do some layoffs because we do work down at Youngstown State University. And when Youngstown State University closed, we did have to lay off staff there. And like Joe, working to stay in contact with those individuals to make sure they're okay. Because it's our philosophy as a business that, you know, if we can't help our Compass family, we have no business trying to help the community at large. And we feel very strongly that our Compass family um, needs to be healthy and happy so that they can do their job at the highest level for the more than 7,500 people we serve on an annual basis in our various programs. And so, you know, the fear and anxiety that was going on with this COVID is, is real and it's present. And we needed to take an, a dose of our own medicine of looking at how are we going to, as leaders and, and, and owners and uh, managers of businesses to help ourselves be able to stay strong and focused to be able to help our staff deal with the uncertainty and the challenges that were there. Um, one of the things that, you know, I, we work with together collaboratively with the, with the board is addressing stigma. And one of the things I think that employers don't do is they think that if somebody has an addiction or a mental illness, that's a private issue. And that's something that really, you know, needs to be kept, you know, at a, a very far arm's length away. And unfortunately, if you take that approach, we're going to miss the opportunity of having and working with 
outstanding employees that have been with your organization, whether it's a year or 10 years, to be able to give them the support that they need to deal with the challenges of life that come forward. And so because somebody has an addiction or because somebody has a mental illness does not mean that they are not able to recover and overcome uh, the, the adversity that's with their addiction or their mental illness and continue to be very, very productive workers uh, and being successful, not only for themselves as individuals, but also for the companies in which they're working for. And we see daily uh, people recovering, people staying in recovery, people working in all walks of life, whether you're an engineer, a nurse, uh, an architect, working in construction, um, working in a fast food, uh, working as the laborer, we see all walks of life and all walks of life are affected by mental illness and addiction. And just like somebody who has diabetes, that person watches their, their diet, takes their insulin and is, remains healthy and remains productive, remains able to contribute and participate in society. And that's the same thing that happens with somebody who may, have, may, may suffer from, a, uh, from major depression. They're seeing their counselor, they're seeing their uh, uh, psychiatric professional, and they may be on medication. And being on that medication uh, and being in, engaged with that counseling is just like you going to your primary care physician to get your insulin uh, and to be able to continue to go to work and continue to be productive at the workplace. And I, I, I hope that employers can see the fact that they've invested thousands of dollars in their employees. And if they can help that employee overcome a hurdle or an obstacle that they're facing with their addiction and or uh, a, you know, uh, a mental illness uh, because of what's going on right now and the stress and anxiety, they can ensure that they can keep that individual uh, who, who's had tenure and who's shown that they can do the job. And then you're not backfilling that position. You're not spending more money on training and retraining and then losing productive losing productivity there. So from an addressing stigma standpoint, you know, I truly believe that healthy people means healthy employees and healthy employees create healthy businesses and those healthy businesses with those healthy employees and healthy communities uh, and help, help healthy employees make healthy communities. And, you know, together, all of our organizations are serving people within this community. And the vast majority of the individuals that we're serving are employed. And so we're here as a support system to the employers of our community and their employees to help them stay productive and engaged in their work environment. One of the things that you know, I wanted to talk about just briefly of signs and symptoms of you know, mental illness and during uh, you know, looking at some of these episodes that we're, that we're facing, I mean, you're gonna see individuals that, you know, employers may look at, their managers may look at, somebody that has some increased anxiety. Uh, as Carolyn was talking about, people feeling hopeless, uh, people having real, real difficult concentrating. Uh, and then thus, if they're having difficulty concentrating, they may be having difficulty sleeping. They may be quick to anger when they were very much never really, you know, a person who was really quick to anger. And they also may become socially withdrawn. And so those are signs that you could see that somebody may be suffering uh, from uh, some stress and anxiety. And you might have individuals who are coming in late to work. Uh, that could be because they could be potentially, you know, abusing uh, substances or using substances inappropriately uh, that are causing them some difficulty. And engaging them early and fast to help them will help them get engaged with, you know, a provider in our community that can preserve and keep that employee, uh, you know, working. Uh, just some some numbers from uh, SAMHSA, you know, people staying at home, and, and we've heard the issues of people staying at home and uh, from a, a binge drinking standpoint. Um, excessive drinking for uh, a woman is having more than uh, four drinks at an occasion, and it's having more than five for a man. Uh, and for a woman having more than eight drinks uh, in a week and 15 drinks uh, for during a week for a male. Uh, and, you know, those are some significant things. And as people move out from being at home, uh, we, we want to help people because 
we pray and hope that if somebody was abusing or ex excessively drinking, that they, it has not become habitual now and in, to help them reintegrate back into the workforce so that they can be as uh, uh, productive as possible. And, you know, when we talk about the new, the new normal, all we can say, I think we can say collectively is that our individual behavior, our individual mental health is more important than ever in being able to help ourselves, being able to help our families and friends, and being able to help our coworkers so that we can come out of this pandemic very successfully together. Right. Joe, thanks so much. These, those are really great comments, really great perspective you shared. And, and I want to build upon this notion of stigma and open this question up for the panel. This is a question we've, re we've received on stigma. So as we're all employers and we have teams that we collaborate with and lead on a da daily basis, what techniques or methods have you seen effective in breaking the stigma. Uh, so many, in so many workplaces, there's pride associated with performance and there's performance management and rankings. And, and, uh, and so, so many would, pro it's probably not encouraged to, to be transparent and open up. So can, uh, this question is open for anyone to share. What, uh, what have you seen to be effective as far as creating that opportunity for dialogue uh, so there isn't the stigma associated? Where does it start? Does it start with the leader? I think it begins in terms of, uh, similar to parents talking to kids, it's inviting, inviting the discussion so that you may notice a productivity problem, performance problem among one of your employees, and there are different approaches to take with that. You know, one can be a, a very uh, closed, directive approach that you're not meeting your expectations. We have to take some type of disciplinary action. Another could be to simply sit down with them privately and say, look, you know, if there's something going on in your personal life, let's, let's talk about it. It's okay. We have resources to help you with that. We share the same goal as you, and that's to be productive and successful in your workplace. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And I, I think the other thing that uh, Neil Kennedy has done throughout this process and continues to do is to sit down and I individually talk to not just patients, but to our, our staff. If there's a uh, concern, and there has been, a real panic that's come over some of our staff. We've recently lost a couple of our patients uh, to overdoses and uh, to illness. And the grief that our staff have been struck with over this period of time has increased. And so it's a matter of sitting down and checking in and saying, you know, uh, I, I, I'm noticing that there's some, you're preoccupied. How can I be of assistance? Because Ideally, we want to foster a workplace that's good for our patients and for our staff. And the only way to do that is for us to be willing to sit down and talk openly with each other uh, and take away any of the pressures that people feel, particularly those that are working in this field of saying, you know what, I need a mental health day. I need, I need a day off so that I can regroup, regroup because that particular patient was a part of my life for the last 65 days and now is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. Having that kind of a, a stress level keeps somebody from really giving their A game when they want to. And uh, it's, it's really been uh, my job, at least through this process, has been to be a listener and to connect the dots for people, including my staff, to the agencies or to the help that they might need during this period of time. And I think that's what we're going to have to continue to do throughout this process. Right, so yeah, yeah, yes, Carolyn, great points. And to Larry, what if someone's wearing a mask? I, I heard the word sit down, one-on-one, -on -one, conversation, listen. That's not scalable, right? That, that's a signal, you notice something and you intervene versus someone who's just doing their thing but quietly struggling and they're wearing a mask. Like, what do you do in that case? How do you create an open environment? So even if someone doesn't display signals, you can still get them to kind of come forward. Any you know, thoughts on that, Larry? It's interesting that you say that because one of the things that sort of relates to that is the fact that 93% uh, of how we communicate is nonverbal. And, and so we're, we're used to, in this profession, we're used to kind of reading people 
And you said masks, I'm gonna, you, mask, so you said masks sort of figuratively, but I'm gonna say mask officially when people are wearing masks, it's much more difficult <laughs> to read, you know, where they're coming from and understand because you're not able to see some of those emotions. But I, I think it's really important for us to reach out to those folks because the ones who are quiet and the ones who aren't talking about it are usually the ones that we need to reach out to the most. Um, and I think we just, it's just a matter of checking in on them. And sometimes we all have employees that are the ones who, we spend a lot of time with our employees who are having problems, whether it's performance problems or otherwise. And yet we don't spend enough time with those people who are coming to work every day, doing their job, doing it well, not causing any problems. And those people need as much of our attention as anyone. And so I think it's, it's, it's just about reaching out, asking people how they are and meaning it genuinely and not just, you know, hey, how you doing and not, on your way out the door, but really talking to them about asking them how they're feeling. And again, we, we kind of go back to this, but really validating the fact that of these feelings that they have are genuine. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also think it's important from a practical standpoint um, as people who run businesses that we have to have that conversation with them about how do we separate this anxiety? How do we separate the stuff that you're dealing with, whether it's in the workplace or whether it's at home? And how do you separate that from the fact that you have a job to do? And you have to be able to sometimes use your work as, an, as a positive way to escape from some of those stresses that you're feeling. And, uh, and I think that's a very difficult dis discussion to have with somebody. But I think if they know that you're coming from a good place and that you're genuinely concerned about them, then it's really easy to translate that conversation into how it's affecting them at work. Right, this gets back to that topic of product, productive stress we talked about before. Do, you know, so many environments do function on you know, high performance, encouraging people to, to do their best and to work hard. Is this a time where you have to back off of that a little bit or do you recalibrate the productive stress level? What's the balance there? Well, I think it, Neil Kennedy, I mean, I'm sure I've got either some staff listening or board members. I, 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 <clears throat> I've been accused of many things and probably being a battle axe is one of them. I, uh, I have a tendency to believe strongly that I'm not going to ask you to do anything that I wouldn't ask of myself. At the same time, I think it's, uh, it's important to strike a balance both individually and collectively. And I think Neil Kennedy, we have 81 staff. I can tell you right now throughout this process, we've only had one person that has had to be out for a significant period of time. And we've been open every day. So part of that is also appreciating people. Gratitude gets us many, many places. Appreciation does the same. And if, you know, at Neil Kennedy, we have spent uh, the entire history of our agency working the 12 step process, 12 step facilitation. And that really is recognizing that we're powerless over certain things. I have no control over the pandemic, but I have control over how I treat my colleagues, the staff, and the patients. And if we can bring the very best part of ourselves forward, uh, then that creates a, a, a relaxed enough atmosphere that people are able to say their thoughts. I think also getting them engaged in solution building, whether that's you know, sewing mask, literally mask for our patients, which some of our staff have done and brought those in as, as a way for us to utilize their skills over and beyond what they might be doing for us at Neil Kennedy uh, to help the process. And these are things that engaging uh, in a different way or thinking outside of the box, I think is required, uh, particularly when you're up against some tough times. And Other things, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, Carolyn, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. I was just going to say, I, I think it's important to mention that, you know, the word itself, productive stress, you know, a certain amount of stress is okay. Right. A certain amount of stress is good, is productive, because it helps us focus more. It may lead to enhanced performance. I think if you talk to Michael Jordan or any entertainer um, or even us in terms of preparing for this, there's a certain amount of, of stress involved with those things that make you focus more and tune into your performance. It's when it becomes unhealthy, um, you know, that, that we have to be concerned. Unhealthy stress, you know, we're, we're beginning to have somatic complaints, headaches, stomach aches, and a great deal of fatigue. Uh, 
then it begins to interfere, not enhance performance. And that's where we have to step in and try to address those and offer help. Well, from a productive stress standpoint, Jeff, just to you know, go back to doing this, doing uh, these webinars now. I mean, we've gone to Google Meets, and I will tell you that I, I had a number of staff members, a good number of staff members that were really concerned about going this, going this way. Um, and it was, it was a challenge. But I will tell you, at the end of the day, um, as people got into it and it was something new, something that was different, the stress of getting used to it became something that was, became very, very positive for our employees. And I will tell you, for a number of our clients who, um, the people that we serve, the staff, you know, uh, have embraced it. And again, instead of talking to somebody on the phone, being able to see that person's face to, to you know, again, without a mask physically on, but, you know, be able to see that smile, to be able to see that response. But one of the things I think that this, this created is it created some positive in, innovation in, where, in, a, in an area which, you know, people really didn't want to look at telehealth. And telehealth is working and it's working pretty well. And some success stories of people feeling comfortable in their own house on a webcam, feeling that they can now really express more than being in the office because they were in their own space. Right. And so while it was very stressful for the person maybe at the beginning, as well as the employee, it has driven something positive because now that person sitting in their dining room or sitting in their kitchen uh, or, you know, living room were able to articulate some things that they didn't necessarily may have felt as comfortable doing it face to face. So was there, this is an interesting question for everyone. The, the telehealth has come up consistently uh, today in this conversation. So while we're probably increasing the reach, right, we can effectively scale the support we provide. Uh, is it as impactful, more impactful, less impactful, or, or as impactful, or is it just different? Because it's, it sounds like this trade-off, perhaps there isn't a trade-off of if you get more reach and get more people comfortable, you could potentially serve more people and support them through this process. Well, if I can just real quick, uh, it, it has helped tremendously because I think Larry had said that dealing with uh, transportation uh, and not being able to get, you know, some individuals that, you know, use our, our WRTA bus, it may take them a half hour, 45 minutes to get to an appointment, sometimes an hour. Now it's, it's eliminating a stressor on them by you know, getting to where they may have difficulty if their car breaks down or something else to be able to have that, uh, that session uh, via you know, a Google Meet. And they're comfortable, the, the, the clinician's comfortable, and you're able to serve more people because you don't have to worry about you know, limits the, the number of no-shows. And if somebody does not show, then you can still reach out to another person who may need and want some additional services and speak with them. So the reach gets bigger. I think the reach does get bigger, but there's a, there's a fidelity to bringing a group together when, it, when we're talking about substance use disorder that bar none keeps a person honest in their recovery. And that face-to-face -face look, and even though you can see each other on, on Zoom, there's something about the presence of each of us with each other uh, that has that has lasted the length of time that Neil Kennedy has been around since 1946. So uh, there is what we're hoping in the future is that we're able to provide choice and that there are going to be those that have a preference of wanting to come back to our facility, to our main building for outpatient versus doing a, just a sole te telehealth. And we want to be open for that. We understand that we're planning for that now. Uh, and things do have to be ramped up gradually. But there, from an SUD perspective, substance abuse uh, treatment perspective, you, you can't beat a face-to-face. -face. And uh, because it does, it keeps us honest. Uh, you know, and as often as it's said, um, another addict can pick up if you're lying to them and, uh, and can call you on it. And, and there is something to be said about that. So then telehealth in this instance becomes a touch point or a reinforcement mechanism, maybe not a primary delivery method, correct? I, I agree. I, I think what, and, and Carolyn mentioned about it, I think it's about choice. Yeah. Um, there are some folks who would prefer to be able to come in 
Um, and there's other folks that are gonna, we're gonna be able to reach through telehealth that we would not have been able to reach otherwise. Um, but I also wanna say that it, it, it really is honing the skills of our, our clinicians yep. and even for physicians, because there's a lot of things that we're doing through uh, primary health care that we can do through telehealth too, but it's the skill and the talent of those, whether it's the doctors on the primary health care side or the, or the clinicians on the mental health side or addiction side, that can understand, well, this is somebody who I think we really need to get in here and spend a little bit extra time with. And, and I think those are the skills that people are starting to develop. I see. And uh, Joe Crusoe, when you and I were talking about, you know, seeking out and, and, you know, looking for support so often, you know, could you explain the situation where someone's within an environment where they're sheltering in place, where there potentially is someone in that same household that is limiting their access to seeking treatment. Could you, could you speak to that a little bit, maybe methods or ways to encourage individuals, how, how they can perhaps solve for that problem? Well, I mean, we really want to try to, you know, be open and honest with the individual uh, to work, to seek, to engage them um, in their, in their space and in their, in, in, in their time. Uh, anytime that you know, somebody's really bullied into doing something, you may not get them have the buy-in. But in these confined spaces, again, if people are withdrawing, uh, you know, into their rooms, you know, working to get them out and engaged, you know, whether it's sitting down for a meal, uh, food always brings people together, um, and you know, you know, trying to see if you can engage in a, you know, in a in a board game, uh, in some other you know activity. And, and then really try to talk about, you know, how, how are you feeling? And, and I think as Carolyn said, truly be there to listen. Um, and then, you know, say, everybody needs help. I mean, I need help every day. And so reaching out for help is not a bad thing. It's actually a very good thing. And it's actually incredibly, incredibly healthy uh, to do so. And, and I think when we eliminate those, uh, those fears, uh, it makes a huge difference for not only that family unit uh, that's you know confined together, but truly that person that may be isolating. Right, and so you'll find telehealth solutions are ways in which uh, it, it's often can it be the start of a great uh, program? Yeah, a good way to kick off. It, a yes, program? It, it, and, it, and it can be, and it, and I I believe as well in, that it's it creates a choice. And you know sometimes you know people feel uncomfortable. You're going to a location. Who am I going to see? Do they look like me? Are they, do I have something in common with them? And if you could have, you know, a preliminary conversation with somebody via, you know, via telehealth on a webcam and, and it's all of a sudden, hey, I can relate. I mean, you know, we look alike, uh, you know, you, you know, we have some things in common. And so, you know, breaking down that barrier of, God, where am I going to go? Who am I going to see? What's this person going to be like? What's the environment going to be like? Well, then they can see it. Right. So it sounds like telehealth has been something just like uh, we've heard often, these situations, these crises, they affect, accelerate transformation, right? The transformation was already happening. Telehealth has been with us for next several years now, but accelerated the pace of change to where, the, you know, from a new normal standpoint, perhaps telehealth from an initiation and an ongoing support model, not replacing face-to-face, -face, but can be a great supplement to uh, an overall treatment program. I think it's another tool in our toolbox because I, you know, we, we were talking about how we eliminate stigma. If we're going to look at a whole health approach for um, these chronic illnesses, as we have certainly don't have problems when we say that somebody has diabetes, I think Joe brought this up, or if somebody has heart disease, they're, they're, they're not frowned upon. But unfortunately in our society, oftentimes mental illness, bipolar disorder, depression, substance use disorder, are thought to be weak characteristics. And, and if we could accept them as a part of the health community, the issues that face uh, Americans, uh, people in Youngstown, as well as you know, people in Columbus, Ohio, or Cleveland, the point of the matter is, is there is a sense of belonging when we're able to reduce the stigma and offer up choices to people so that they can then feel good within their choice. Right. That's going to strengthen their recovery. Right. And, uh, I think the other one other point that I'd like to make is we've got to, I would encourage businesses in our community throughout to, to not be afraid to ask the question, are you depressed? You know, are you, are you drinking more than you normally have? But 
have you thought that you might hurt yourself? These are things that if we can ask that question, then we can address the health issue. You can get and connect people to care. Now, do you recommend to be that candid? Is it best directly offered? And, and does a business leader have to open themselves up, lower their guard perhaps to say, because I am, or because I understand, you know, invite them into perhaps saying yes? I think it can be, I think it can be as simple as, you know, I'm noticing that something you're not, it's not your A game. I'm noticing there's something going on for you. How can I help? If they're willing to open up at that point and they're willing to say, listen, I am not in a good space. You know, it might be a matter of saying, can you tell me more? Right. Help me understand think, your need. Go ahead, Larry. I also think that that's why these, these employee assistance programs are so critical. Absolutely. Because if you do say to somebody, how are you doing? Is everything all right? If they do start to open up, we realize, you know, we got to keep a distance on some of these issues. But to be able to say, if there is something that's bothering you, we have a resource for you. And right. the great thing about EAP services is that they're independent, they're private. And as, a, as an employer, I'm asking you if you need help. And if you need help, I'm saying you can get it. We provide it for you. But I don't have to have the details and I don't have to get too much into it. That's right. That's yeah, a great good. point. Because as, as business owners, business owners, small business owners are so passionate about their business and they're so committed. They, they live and breathe it every day. And oftentimes we assume everyone's just as excited to go to work as we are. <laughs> um, but to, to, and many are not comfortable discussing these types of issues. So to be able to hand it off through an, it's an EAP, right? An employee assistance program. Yes. To make that handoff is really a tremendous um, service you can provide to a business owner or a manager that really is not comfortable in these topics. And, and it, you know, maybe might not want to know too much. Well, I think and that's Jeff, right. I think, I think the other thing that I would say is it goes hand in hand with drug-free workplace training, understanding the dynamics of addiction. Um, and that's a matter of, you know, we offer this to business communities throughout and have for the longevity of the time I've been here and before. And that's to help employers know, okay, what are some of these signs and symptoms? And then what can I do? Who can I connect to? And right. there's obviously a cadre of my you know, colleagues on, on this webinar right now that we oftentimes make referrals to, if, if not just ourselves. So right. it's important that I think that we help educate each other uh, during this time frame. Right. I, I think go also for, go ahead. for our employees, keep in mind something else that's happening. A lot of them now, um, if they're, whether they're working at home, from home, or they're coming in, they're still having to have um, additional resources and additional time they're going to have to spend with their children if they have children, because they're helping them with school and things like that. And a lot of us have elderly parents who are, we're very concerned about that because we're not allowed to have that kind of constant contact that we would like to have with them. So there's this added stress that everybody has at home too, because they have the responsibilities at work, but now their responsibilities at home have just doubled and tripled. So I think recognizing that stress too is just very important. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I just want to address real quick the question you asked, you know, should you ask that pointed or direct a question? Are you depressed? Are you thinking about hurting yourself? Uh, I would say absolutely yes to that. And not, it's not your lead question. It's not what you begin with. And it has to be done with empathy and not in an accusatory manner. Right. But I think the fear of asking that question is the exact stigma that we're talking about, that we wouldn't hesitate to ask somebody, how's your back doing? Or is your blood pressure under control? That's right. Uh, but we're afraid to ask them that question. And I think it's absolutely appropriate to ask in the right way with empathy and concern. Not in a accusatory way and it it, it it it's a service to that employee that shows that you care and you know we as at compass um, work with Meridian to be our employee assistance program and we have a, we have our own we have an employee assistance program as well at compass that we work with lots of different employers on we have one, you know we work with Meridian and with Neil Kennedy from uh, an employee assistance standpoint you know, we're, we have employees and, you know, that small business person that you were talking about that, you know, comes to work and is really passionate about it. And they see somebody who's been with them for a while and they're not on their A game. I think as Larry said, it's okay to sit down and talk with them and say, Hey, you know, uh, you know, what's going on? I mean, cause it does affect your work performance. 
but you can get them engaged in a, in, in a service and an activity that keeps them employed right. and keeps them productive. And the, again, you, the, the, the cost of replacing that position, you know, some positions are thousands of dollars of recruiting and then retraining and lost productivity. And you, with a, a simple engagement and empathy and care to connect them with uh, the, the invaluable services that are here in our community. And right. Go ahead, Joe. So I, I was going to say, I mean, work, workforce development, that topic I hear consistently day in and day out, workforce development and the investment we make in employees to build a company, tools, training, technology. Uh, well, how about mental health? Right. That's that's an investment that's probably overlooked. It's absolutely overlooked, Jeff. And from a mental health and addiction standpoint, I mean, our organizations serve every walk of life. Um, rich to rich to poor to poor, every um, ethnic group, every racial group, it doesn't matter. And when we talk with the, you know, with the chamber and with the business journal, we are as community service organizations, very passionate about what we do, but we are also working to help the individuals of these employers, our fellow small businesses, keep their employees employed and keep healthy families, healthy individuals, which again, then drives the business's bottom line because right. those productive people are contributing to not only that empl that employer, but also to the community at large. And I think it that's something is, that's really over missed or overlooked. It's a hidden cause of unproduct unproductive time. You know, you think about people who are having to go home and take care of a, of a sick relative, or um, maybe they're grieving through the loss of somebody close to them or maybe they're just stressed about their relationships that they're having. And those are those things that are sort of hidden, but they're clearly affecting their ability to, to be productive in the workplace. And so the more you can help them with those kind of things, the better. That's excellent. So we have uh, two more questions to go before we wrap up and make final comments. Uh, one question uh, that, that's come in uh, via the Q&A, uh, really, and then the last question, I wanna get back to Joe Shiroki and talk about how we address you know, these issues with kids and, and deal with the socialization um, kind of aspects. But, but first, before we get to that, a question about abusive relationships during this time. Are there services available, um, you know, because we're sheltering in place and perhaps once again in these situations that we can't avoid and it's an abusive, what do you recommend for someone like that? Well, if I can, uh, we know that from the domestic violence standpoint and from a sexual assault standpoint, that the stay at home order um, and the, the fact that people were not able to or felt like they could not leave. Our domestic violence shelter of Sojourner House has been open and will be open, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And people can call Sojourner House um, uh, and you know, reach out and we can help them uh, create a safety plan so that they can get out of that abusive relationship or that abusive environment. Uh, again, from a sexual assault standpoint, uh, same thing, we are here and uh, available to help meet the needs of uh, victims. And again, we know we've received calls, but we do not have as many people that have come into shelter as we typically have and I believe it's been a, you know, kind of a fear that can they really go somewhere? And they can. They can come to Sojourner House Domestic Violence Shelter uh, to get an escape from that, uh, that violence. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the last question before we wrap up. So uh, Joe, at Alta, specifically with children and, and many, many of us, you know, this is a we learned a lot about employee assistance programs and how important they are to invest in, in the overall, the full person and how they contribute to work. Uh, and we deal with that home stresses, many of which are our kids have not left the neighbor, well, the yard in you know two months now. And they, they have to live through their phones and through their Xboxes. Uh, how do you deal with those situations and and is this once again do you let them play a little extra time because of the virtual connections or do you still enforce screen time and and what impact will that have once we come out of this yeah i think the answer to that is, is yes we should be a little more flexible with their use of of electronics and screen time 
Uh, no, we shouldn't let them increase their time doing isolated activities. So playing games by themselves and, and not interacting socially with others. But look, you know, our, our kids were brought up with this technology and, and this is how they communicate. In fact, when we didn't have the pandemic, they communicate more through electronics than they do face to face. So we absolutely feel it's important for them to continue that socialization through screen time uh, when and where they can allowing them to spend more time doing isolated activities, surfing the internet, uh, you know, playing games by themselves. No, no more than, than normal. The other thing I think is important is, you know, our, our number one role as parents is to protect our kids. And there's gonna come a point in time where we have to make a decision and say, is it okay now for me to let my child go next door, down the street or to a playground? And I think the answer to that you know, fear of the unknown causes more anxiety than anything. And I think that there's going to come a point where we have to take that leap. And for many parents, it may be a month or two months down the road. And for many parents, it might be today or tomorrow. Uh, as long as kids are, you know, practicing cleanliness and social dis distancing and wearing a mask where they can and should, um, we can let them get together in small, in small activities. Um, but in terms of screen time, yes, when it's social, but there should still be limits. Right, right. And I, that's an important point that, that you brought up. It's the isolated activity, right? So if they're engaging with others, you know, it's, it's pr okay. productive to some extent. But, but when they go down that tunnel down into isolating activities, that's a warning sign? That's time to limit, to limit the time. And you know they still have other responsibilities, whether it be depending on their age, house chores, homework. Um, so all of that shouldn't change. You know we shouldn't. If we were concerned about our kids spending uh, four or five hours a night playing Call of Duty in their room by themselves before the pandemic, we should be concerned about it now too. Um, and and they have a family. We want them interacting with the family as much as possible as well. So. Uh, a little more flexibility, but certainly not carte blanche. Right, right. Okay, that, that's great. Uh, once again, that's a very important topic that we can kind of pursue again, because we're all, you know, actually glad the Fortnite craze has died down a little bit because uh, <laughs> I can't imagine what, what it would be like if that were still extremely popular. So at this point, we, we are approaching uh, the end of the webinar, the end of the virtual event, and we, we've had a number of discussions. We've covered a lot of the topics across the questions we've received through Facebook Live. We've covered a lot through the Q&A function here. So I will ask, uh, give everyone an opportunity to offer parting thoughts, contact information. I'm actually going to put, put your information up on the screen. I'm going to share my screen and put your information up. So. Um, before we uh, go, would you like to say, uh, Larry, I'll go kind of in uh, counterclockwise on the screen, Let's start with you and then move to, to Carolyn. Well, um, I, hopefully we'll get this information out to folks, but uh, Meridian's phone number 330-797-0070. Um, and obviously, you know, check our website if you want any information or if you have any questions at all. Um, I think what people hopefully got out of this today is uh, Mahoning County is very rich in skills and talents um, when it comes to understanding these issues. And I'm so proud that I'm part of this system with the Mental Health Board and, and my peers here. Um, I guess the only I guess, uh, parting thing I would say to folks uh, during this continued time with uh, the pandemic and people staying in their homes and feeling this extra stress is try to have some self-awareness of um, sometimes we search for temporary distractions to kind of make us not think about this for a while. And sometimes those, uh, those temporary distractions might be drinking a little bit too much, um, might be eating a little bit too much and doing some of those kind of things to an excess. So I think try to have some self-awareness and be aware of your friends and your family. Um, if you see them trying to do that same kind of thing, again, those temporary distractions, just to kind of forget about all this for a while. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate your time today, and thanks for all the great insight. Thank you. Uh, uh, Carolyn, what, what parting thoughts would you like to offer, please? Uh, I, I think you've got our telephone numbers, but I would just like to leave folks with a couple thoughts. Um, it's important for us to ask people how they're doing. Uh, it's important for us to try to figure out how we keep people safe. 
Uh, we need to be there for each other. You know, connectivity is critical. Uh, helping them connect to the care that they need, whether it's one of the four of us or anybody else throughout our community. And then follow up. You know, caring is, uh, it's, it's very inexpensive and connecting by phone doesn't take a whole lot of time. So in the midst of this isolation or this new normal that we're in, I would just ask all of us to reach out to each other. And if we can be of assistance at Neil Kennedy, our number I think will be flashing up soon. I'd leave you with one other number. If anybody that you know of is in dire need of any kind of help, they can always call the help network of Mahoning County and that's 211. They have additional uh, resources that could be very helpful to families and businesses, uh, particularly those experiencing depression, mental illness, suicide ideation, and substance use. Thanks, Caroline. And we will certainly uh, link up, we w as we provide the full recording of the webinar and the follow-up story, we will link up all the phone numbers and the websites and the contact information and, be in, and make sure that's distributed across our platform of, of email, uh, social media, and the print publication as well. So thank you for that. 211, is that the number, Carolyn? That's correct, 211. 211, okay, thank you. And uh, Joe Shiroki, please, uh, final comments? Uh, well, just you see our name there, and it's very easy to find us, altacaregroup.org. And uh, you know we are here for the community. We have been throughout and will continue to be. Um, and the only other thing I would leave, uh, besides a thank you to the Mahoney County Mental Health and Recovery Board for uh, sponsoring this, is also, um, you know, we all have businesses to operate. And, you know, in order for those businesses to operate, we have to have healthy employees. And that means doing what we can to keep our employees healthy and not just physically, but emotionally as well. And I hope that some of the things that we talked about today uh, could be takeaways in terms of how to keep employees engaged and emotionally healthy and checking in on them. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate your, your uh, time and attention and comments today. And Joe Caruso, you uh, bring us on home, please. Well, Jeff, I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate the Business Journal and, again, the Mahoney County Mental Health and Recovery Board's uh, support and sponsorship, as well as uh, my uh, colleagues, who I have the utmost respect for, uh, for their organizations and, you know, my organization and uh, the people that are on the front lines doing this work. Um, uh, Help Network of Northeast Ohio provides a great resource for, of 211 to all of us, uh, to all of, you know, all of our agencies uh, that, that are here in the community. And I just want uh, to leave everybody with just the thought of being together and enjoying and being present in the, with the time that you have. Uh, I think many times we are looking so far down the road, we forget to take a look at what's right here in front of us and what we have right in front of us, even though it's a little scary at this point in time, is pretty damn good. So thank you guys very much. I have to ask a final question. Uh, we've alluded to, but not said the word mindfulness and gratitude, appreciation, I'm just curious, uh, show of hands, if you don't mind, how many of us on this call today uh, practice mindfulness or meditation? Yeah, that's wonderful. It's, it's a great tool and it really, it's an opportunity. We all probably have our patterns that we've established. Uh, I'll share mine personally. I get up, hit the coffee maker, stare at it until it's ready, pour the cup, go down to the basement and, and either use the uh, Sam Harris's waking up app or um, the five, um, the other Dan Harris, he has an app too, but no relation, right? Uh, and, and just go through a quick five to 10 minute session just to kind of get things situated for the day. So uh, anyone want to share their mindfulness practice? I'm very similar. I, I get up in the morning and, uh, go downstairs, spend 10 to 15 minutes in the living room quietly by myself and just focusing on right now and, and not thinking about my day ahead or not thinking about the day behind, but just thinking about enjoying the quiet of the morning. Right. Excellent. Excellent. I spend about five minutes in prayer every morning uh, and at least say a decade of the rosary. Right. Day one. Wonderful. Perfect. Perfect. 
And so I, I'm sorry, I, a last question came in, I have to ask while we're all here still. Uh, there is a question around the use of PPE, so personal protective equipment. So the in-person interaction, group discussion, still very important. Um, any recommendations on how we transition? You know, we've talked about masks, both literal and virtual, you know, how do we look at the signals and capture things if people are, are shielded? And, and is that a practice being in place in each of your facilities? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're using PPE constantly, whether it's gloves, whether it's mask, we're sanitizing, wiping down everything. We're asking people, our staff, our patients every day, their temperature is taken. We have a series of questions. Um, I think this is going to be part of the new normal for a long time. Uh, I anticipate we'll be wearing masks all the time. Um, what we have done, uh, if I'm seeing somebody individually, particularly as a check-in, it's, uh, I, you know, I have my mask on, they have theirs on, and we keep a social distance, uh, you know, at least uh, six chairs between us. And um, we, I just think that that's probably what we're going to have to continue to do. Uh, there's discussion right now amongst even some of us in our trade associations about uh, when do you stop doing some of that? How do you return to a normal life? <laughs> this is our new normal. Mm -hmm. And figuring out how we accept this, you know, acceptance is a big part of this next phase. And one of the things we're doing, I mean, we're, we're providing PPP to, or PPE to all of our um, staff, but also offering it to any client that would walk in, we would offer a mask to them and gloves if they choose. But we also, in preparation for this, we had ordered uh, small little uh, plastic desk shields, very light, you know, pick them up, put them on the desk for uh, just a, a slight barrier between us and the person on the other side of the desk. Same thing where as we, as we bring back, I mean, we're still seeing people uh, face to face in our residential programs, obviously, but then also some outpatient uh, activity that we are going to be looking as we bring people back, you know, people using PPE and continue to use PPE, but also, as Joe said, uh, a plexiglass divider, as you're seeing in many of the, and we don't want it to, you know, we need to talk about and be open in this, this new normal that it's not because you have something or I have something, it's just the matter of where we are right now and just facing the reality of, of that. And it's not to, uh, you know, to create a barrier, but we do, based on the public health, we do need to create that barrier. And I think what's really critical is uh, not only putting a lot of those kind of practices in place to make sure that we're protecting our staff so that we can continue to provide the care that we need to do for, for our clients, but I think it's also extremely important about how we communicate what we're doing. And so people understand why we're asking them to wear masks and why we're putting these things in place in a way that, uh, that people can understand and appreciate. Because everybody these days seem to be interpreting the use of masks differently. So we want to make sure we communicate the message properly. Right, right. Well, with that, this is a great place to conclude our conversation for today. And this, and this doesn't, this means this, I think this is the first of many conversations we'll be having. We really learned a lot today, the importance of asking the direct question, right? So just having that conversation, looking for signals, asking, asking the direct question, and also uh, offering employee assistance programs. Employees are one of the most, the biggest investments we make besides our, there's PPE property plants and equipment, and there's PPE personal protection equipment. And, you know, so often from an accounting standpoint, we look at our capital expenditures, but our human resources and our workforce is an important part and, and having employee assistance programs to give someone that on-ramp to seeking help is, is really critical. So with that, uh, I will sign off once again. This is Jeff Herman with the Business Journal. Really appreciate your time and attention today. And this full recording will be published in its entirety, as well as all the links and the phone numbers and the contact information to make sure everyone gets the help they need. It's out there and it's just a matter of, of, of asking for it. So thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate your time today. Very productive discussion.